messed up. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. We are going to go over Note 20 one more time since I didn't finish it. It's all the good stuff. Nobody showed up today? Hardly anybody. You did. I'm like, nobody, thank you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Don't Al said he wasn't going to be studying for the comprehensive <laughs> exam. Huh? Al said he wasn't going to be studying for the comprehensive exam. So, and that leaves uh, Engel, Hampton, and uh, Sang Lee Lee. Sang so sometimes doesn't show up anyway, so I don't know what happened to Hampton and uh, Engel. You know? Hampton, uh, Al's not going to show up. Al's not going to show up. Yeah. For the rest of the semester? No, just today. Oh, yeah. He told me. He's got a comprehensive on Saturday. Yeah. So, uh, so, we'll have the SEQs next week. SEQ, thank you for questionnaire. We should do nothing today. Uh, since only on less than half the class showed up. December 5th. Well, we should go over so you can do your grad problem. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, they can read how the do you TV. do that? We got the TV. They can read the TV. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> how do you figure out how to do this? Um, optimize stuff. Yeah. Yeah, Lagrange multipliers. What, what's that? You don't remember Lagrange multipliers in Calc 3? Did you have Lagrange multipliers in Calc 3? I never went in my class in Calc 3. I never okay, we have now learned, you will now learn the mechanics of it. I never went in Calc 2 or Calc 3. And I survived. Okay. But I got a B. We're going to tell all your professors. What about 381? <laughs> huh? Have you ever taken 381? No, I've never taken 381. Oh, okay. Yeah, a lot of things are clear. Wow. Oh, you took, you took the, the engineering statistics, though. Yeah, it's different. What is it called? Well, he was gone for three weeks of the class. We were just doing about that project. Okay, well, now you're going to catch up with everything. I'm going to teach you calculus and your statistics. How's that? Okay. okay. <laughs> I didn't want to go to the couch. It was Perfect. ridiculous. So what, we've gone through about half of these notes, and I wasn't going to publish some more notes, but the point is you didn't, I didn't really need to because uh, we still have some things to do with these. So on page 4 of notes 20, do you, do you need a copy of that? Mm -hmm. You have it? Okay. So what we want to do is, okay, um, do optimal allocation. Um, what was this? That's your review test. Okay. So problem six, is, problem six, by the way, is all about this kind of situation uh, where I ask you to do an optimal allocation. So we might even just do it with just two levels first. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's take a really simple case. Do um, you have notes for this? They're right there in front. Of, I said notes twenty, page four. Oh, the last time. Two case of two strata. First, first case of two strata only. Let's work it out without Lagrange multipliers. Okay? Figure out how to do it. In case of two strata only, then I go on to higher cases. So the situation is that you have two strata, and we'll say Okay, I think in the, in the examples in the book, for example, we can look even at one of the problems in the book to make this clearer. You've got two problems based on one situation where there's just two strata. Okay? And those are problems 55 and 60. Compare 7.55 and 760. Okay. The designer, of, I'll just give you the situation. The designer of a sample survey stratifies the population into two strata, H and L. H corresponds to high, L to low. Okay? H contains 100,000 people, L contains 500,000. He decides, he decides to allocate and so on and so forth. But the whole point is how should you allocate to minimize the variance of the stratified estimator? Okay, two strata. Strata, strata, H, and L. Okay, and then you have the sample sizes, I mean the population sizes, subpopulation sizes, I should call them. I can 
your expense of H and capital comes from L. Okay? Subpopulate. And then this adds up to capital. Okay? The sum of them. All right? And so I think in your problem, for example, this came out to be, this, this is a, maybe I would just say 100,000 if I want to make calculations. This is 500,000. Okay? And so this came out to be 600,000. Okay? And then you have the subpopulation proportions. And those are WH equals simply 100,000 over 600,000 equals 1 sixth. And W to the alpha equals 5 6. These add up to 1. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's all you've done. And then you have um, the actual subpopulation parameters, which are generally unknown. But for, which we work with anyway to, to get an idea of, to write things down, okay? Generally unknown, and these are, of course, mu sub h and mu sub l, and then sigma sub h. There might be other things too, but we'll just write like that, okay? And we actually wrote a formula for what the population variance is in terms of these, and then population variance. Population mean, we do know how to write that is mu equals w h u h plus w l mu l. Okay, so that's just in this case one six mu h. One six of the high averages plus five six of the low of the lows average. I should put capital in there. Okay. What if you don't know what these mu's h and l? You don't. You don't know them. So it's just, just theoretical. Use a sample it's just theoretical. We need this. But on a homework, do you just use a sample? Depends on the problem. Oh. I don't know what you mean by on the homework. Okay. They sometimes will give them to you, and sometimes they won't. Yeah, if they would. Okay. Them. And then the population variance depends on the context. But they really want you to compare things. I think in the last in problem number sixty-four, when I was doing these comparisons of First, comparing um, two different stratified estimators, I was using the, the actual population parameters. That would give population variance comes out to be sigma squared is equal to summation. Let's see, how did it go? It went W L sigma L squared plus summation W L mu L minus mu squared. Okay. So that would be 1 6 sigma h squared plus 5 6 sigma mu squared plus 1 6 mu high minus the mu. And I can rewrite this down, I guess, squared plus 5 6 mu l minus mu. You can, you can simplify some of these things out of the Okay? So I just leave that all along. Okay, I'm not going to get into a simplification right now. What I want to do is say, I'm going to take a sample, my sample size is going to be n. And that's going to be broken down into two subsample sizes, n sub h and little n sub capital L. I'm going to sample little n sub h from the high uh, values. Population, I'm going to Sample little n sub l values from the so called low values in the population. Okay, the two strata. Somehow you were able to break the inventory down in just two strata. Let's say you have an inventory problem, and you, and you know by both values, either the high book values or low book values, so it's easy to define the strata. Okay, and you would know the capital N sub A and the capital N sub L. So all, the, all this stuff is enough. Okay? Just uh, Okay, now the sample size. The question is, how should I choose these to make the variance of the stratified estimator as small as possible? We said last time that the stratified estimator, which will be unbiased, it is unbiased, unlike the ratio estimators and things like that. Unlike the ratio estimator. 
which was the only compliance one we did have. <laughs> okay. Um, this one is unbiased. And it is uh, because I picked the uh, proportions exactly right. This is WH, then X bar sub H plus WL X bar sub L. All right? So that comes out to be what? One sixth X. I take a sample of size little n sub H from the high values, and I get, and then I multiply that sample average by one sixth, and, add, and then I um, take a sample size little n sub L from the other population. I take the sample mean, multiply by five six, add these two things together, and I get my stratified estimator that's unbiased. That doesn't change. Your stratified estimator doesn't change. It's always that. Okay? What can change are these, these little ends. How, how should I choose this? This is the <coughs> allocation problem. Okay? Wow. See, I can't, I can't change these numbers because I don't know what the mu h and the mu l are. Okay? But I know that mu is. 6 mu ratio plus 5 6 mu ratio plus 5 6 mu L, so I have to match the 1 6 and the 5 6 there. Okay? To get some of this unbiased. In other words, so I won't have a bias of order of 1. I don't want to have a bias of order of 1. That would be bad. Okay? So I have to do it unbiased. I have to get match these exactly. Alright? Now, uh, what is the variance? And we have a general formula for the variance, too. And we, what I'm going to do is ignore the finite population correction in these calculations. All right? Because we're going to assume that uh, here, capital N is very large. Okay? Let's say little N is 100 or something. Or a couple hundred. It's going to be very small compared to this. So we're going to ignore finite population corrections in order to make this problem tractable. And so, uh, then you guys say the variance, ignore, ignoring FPC, there's a very simple formula for the variance of this sum because these are independent estimators of the high and low parameters, mu h and mu l. This is an independent estimator of mu sub h. This x bar sub l is an independent, excuse me, is a, is independently is an estimator of um, mu sub l. So these are two, these, the, the samples that go into mu, X bars of H are not independent because the sampling without replacement. But the sample, but I'm picking from two different currents. Okay, so these estimators are independent. The two, the two samples have nothing to do with each other. Okay, within a sample you have sampling without replacement, so the individual samples are dependent. Okay, but these two estimators are independent. So therefore, the variance of the sum is simply a sum of variances. Sum of variances. And then I can take the scaling factor WH out by squaring it. Uh, so I'm saying this is approximately for this uh, ignoring a finite population correction. Hmm. What is approximately? Whatever, you, whatever approximation sign you want to set. Because actually this is true. And this this is what it's approximate. Okay? Because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ignore the FPC at this point. This is exactly true because you do have independent estimators. Sorry. Now this is approximate. WH squared times, what do we do? Sigma H squared over NH. And now I'm not going to put FPC here. Plus WL squared, sigma L squared over L. 
if you want to, you can make it equal and then ignore it in the next line. 1 minus u n sub h minus 1 over capital S of h minus 1 plus minus u n sub l minus 1 over capital n minus 1. And this is approximately then equal to w h squared sigma h squared over n sub h plus w l squared sigma l squared over n sub l. And you can, what you do know in this situation is what the w's are, all right? You know what the w's are. And we're going to, and the sigmas of h squared, sigma h squared, sigma l squared, those are parameters that I don't know, maybe. But they're parameters, they're fixed numbers, they're not variable. What is variable here, and I want to minimize this thing, okay? What are variable are the n's, okay? So I'm simply going to break it down. If I want to minimize Let's just, what the problem is, minimize um, a over uh, x plus b over y, okay? <laughs> All right? Subject to x plus y is equal to n. That's what I've got. All right? So you just... That's what I've got. i got w h squared this now, and sigma h squared is... No. So, you, so you simply take the partial part of the equation. This varies. Okay, well, uh, not quite because you have this constraint here. What do you do with that constraint? Okay. One way to deal with that constraint is to make a one variable problem. You just say, well, y equals n minus x. And that's the easy way to do it. So let's get the answer first. Two, just two strata. So this is equal to a over x plus b over n minus x. x between 0 and n. Okay? It's obviously not minimized at the end points. <laughs> okay. So that's easy now. Just uh, differentiate. With respect to x, set the derivative equal to 0. Right? Trivial. Obviously, there's a natural minimum. It's only going to, because at the end points, you get infinity. So if there's only one critical point, I'm done. Okay? I don't have to do any second derivatives. Okay. So what's the answer? So let's, let's take this. I'll call this f equals this. This is f equals this. So it's f df dx. Well, let's do the calculus. I <laughs> said so I was going to make you do the calculus today, G. Well, okay, that's the derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared. The derivative of uh, I get another minus n minus x squared, and then times a minus 1 from the derivative of minus x. Okay. So this is equal to b over n minus x squared minus a over x squared. That equals to 0 if and only if what? I'll multiply everything by, uh, well, I'll just put to the two sides. That's the easiest way. b over n minus x squared equals a over x squared. Now put things up in the numerator, maybe. Now oh, take square okay. roots. <laughs> this is take square roots. Why do you take square? Why did you just cross multiply? <laughs> okay, cross multiply, then take square roots. <laughs> Good way I should put a squared and b squared here, because these are all squared. So let's put square signs on the a and the b. That makes it easier. What? Yeah. Oh. Okay, because I can do whatever I want with a and the b. <laughs> I said the problem. I'll put b, b, a is w h sigma h. And B is WL sigma L. Alright? It's, it's nicer. Okay? So now cross multiply and take a square root. X and N minus X are both positive, so there's nothing to worry about there. The parameters are also positive. A and B. So just with that little bit of algebra, you get what do you get? A and B squared, X squared equals A squared, N minus X squared. Take a square root, you get BX equals A, N minus X. Okay. Question. <coughs> How do you know you don't set one of the sides negative? I just said, you everything's positive. X is between 0 and N. N minus X is between oh, okay. 0 and N. Okay? We're working on this. Just the sample sizes have to be positive. Okay? X is N H. This little guy right here. This is X. <coughs> okay? 
A and B are both positive too. I set them up. A is W A sigma H. Okay. So everything's positive there. So it comes up naturally. So put the A over here. You get a plus B X equals A times N. And so X is equal to N times A over A plus B, a fraction of N. So it's that fraction of N. Okay? Which is equal to n times, you just take wh sigma h over wh sigma h as well as wl sigma l. Okay, and then the other one is the other. So what you get in the end is that n sub h, okay, this is a normalization factor. That's a constant down here. Alright, wh sigma h plus wl sigma l, everything's a constant there. It's just a number. But we don't know what sigma h is. But it's fixed for the problem. The variable is n. Little n. Sigma is fixed. I know, but unknown fixed. But unknown how will we optimize fixed. it if we don't know the You don't know how to calculate this. Of course you don't know how to calculate it. That's not the point though. It's not a variable with all make this is proportional, therefore to WH sigma H. Okay? Is another way to say that. Okay? It's a constant times. Alright? In other words, it's a constant times that number times ten. Okay? But the constant is just one over these. So this is one way to say it. The physicists would like to summarize this way. Okay. The higher the sigma, the higher the n for fixed w. Okay? So, I'm sorry. So you don't know how to calculate it. No, you do not. But I can still put it in and get a formula for the variance. So now I'll go ahead and plug it in and get a formula for the variance. You see what this simplifies to? I'm going to plug that in. Okay? okay? So then the variance of x bar, we're going to call it stratified optimal model. Okay? Because they have the optimal parameters ignoring FPC. This is now wh squared sigma h squared over, now I'm going to put the n sub h is this, which is simply wh sigma h is an n. And then I have to divide by the, the right constant, W H uh, sigma H plus W L sigma L. That's the constant of proportionality. Okay. This being plus, then the other term, W L squared, sigma L squared over N times W L sigma L over W L sigma L plus W. So now I can do all that. Now you get a lot of cancellation. And what you get? Uh, little n is constant. You get 1 over n. Is what I, of course, I'm going to get. Okay. One, this cancels with these powers. Okay. This is a constant in the bottom. So that's WH sigma H plus WL sigma L. And then what you get up here, and that's just, and then you just get that same numerator squared. Okay? What? Oh. Because all this stuff, all the denominators went away. Every denominator went away. This denominator was a constant, and just put it out in front. 1 over 1 over A is A, right? So it's, okay, so this just flipped up to the top, okay? So that was one power of WH sigma H plus WL sigma L. The other one, all these denominators went away, okay? So we got WH sigma H plus WL sigma L squared. This is right for the variance, because this was the units of the original dollars, and this is dollar squared. So it means the standard, de standard deviation is maybe the nicest formula, and for the standard deviation, the standard error is standard. X bar is shredded by optimal simple norm square to that. That's WH sigma H plus WL sigma L. So you just take the linear um, combination of the um, standard deviations. It's the smallest you can get. Right. It does make sense, at least it's consistent. 
if you had if you had WH zero, all right, then WL would be one, and you would simply get that all the samples had. I didn't have any stratum H to to sample from. And if you sample it all from the low, and you simply get sigma L over square root of n, which is the correct answer. Sigma over square root of n. Question. This still don't make sense if you don't have a sigmoid, right? We can't calculate it, we can still compare. Actually, what it does show, you can do some comparison, because if I did the proportional method, you can prove that the variance of the stratified proportional uh, is actually less than the variance of the stratified optimal. That's shown in theorem D. Um, let's see, no, no, not theorem D. Uh, let's see, where is it? Where's it show? There, C. You can actually show uh, the difference in the variances. Okay. So you can actually calculate what the variance is with proportional sampling. What is proportional sampling? Let's just go ahead and review this. So you get an idea of how much better it is than a proportional sampling case, depending on if you have some rough idea of what the sigmas is. Okay? But yeah, you can't really calculate it without knowledge of the sigmas. Okay, but suppose you have the book values. You could plug those in and get an idea of what this is. Book value sigmas might not help you very much, unfortunately. But you could um, take the S's and plug it in here. Okay, why not? If you had, yes. if you had some uh, previous data, yeah. So you can sample once and then. You get an idea. You can so do a prototype sample. That's right. You can just do some small samples of so just say 10 each from each. So, so just you know, pluck the S's? Just, just blow a few plucks, okay, and try to get some you know, S's. And, and it would be great, but, you know. But you get an idea, and then you compare it with a different method, which is easier maybe than this optimal. What's the big deal? Just try to optimize. Okay, so maybe I won't go through the, through the comparison, but I should write down a form. Maybe I should. <laughs> I didn't do that in my notes. Uh, I can give you some more notes if you want, but. There is a theorem C, page 235. I'll just note it here. Maybe we can get it in two, two variables. Let's do it in a, we can do it certainly in the two stratum case without too much work. All right, by just a little bit of algebra. If I take uh, ignoring FPC and in the two stratum case, okay, what you have is this. You have the variance of x bar stratified proportional is bigger. Minus the variance x bar stratified optimal is equal to summation WL sigma L minus sigma squared. L goes capital um, capital L is not a good notation here because <laughs> I'm using that as well now. Some over L. Okay, some over the strata. Okay. Uh, this should have been sigma bar, or sigma bar. Sigma bar is equal to um, something different. Sigma, yes, yeah, so you have yet another parameter, WL sigma bar, which is what this was. This is my sigma bar right here. The thing that I came out here. So the, the, standard, the standard deviation of the optimal one was. How would you prove that? Proof, case of two strata only, maybe. I don't think it's going to make any difference, but let's just do that anyway. All right. This is exactly the expression I came with to calculate the variance of the stratified optimal estimator. This is my sigma bar right here. Yeah. So the optimum, or well, the variance of this, the optimum is? So we're saying the difference is this. 
The difference is this, i.e., what we're really doing is just restating a formula, for, we're just restating a formula for stratified proportional, i.e., since variance x bar stratified optimal is equal to 1 over n sigma bar squared, you're saying what the statement of the theorem is, the theorem states a formula for for x variance of the stratified proportional, in essence, is equal to summation WL sigma L minus sigma bar squared. Um, I'm sure there should have been a 1 over n here, probably. 1 over n. This plus sigma bar squared. Okay. So really that's all it boils down to. So this is what we want to prove. And actually that is a simple and actually that's not too difficult because actually I can simplify this. How can you simplify this? Anybody know how to simplify this? See when I do this weighting, okay, how do you expand? You know how to expand summation xi minus x bar squared, right? But there's no weighting. Yes, you do. Summation little xi minus x bar squared is in your statistics course you did it a hundred times, okay? okay so so we x x summation x i squared minus n x bar squared is i goes to one n. Okay, maybe we put the capital n so it's easier. Yeah. Okay. Where cap or x bar is the average. I goes to one to capital n and so on. Alright? That's an identity. What is, how does that identity work if you do weighting? Okay? Here you see I've got a weighted sum here. The WLs are not all equal. Okay? What it works out to is this. The, the formula is summation WL sigma L minus sigma bar squared, because that's exactly the situation. If I subtract off the weighted average inside here, then this comes out to be summation WL sigma L squared minus um, uh, sigma bar squared. Okay. What? From this to that? The very no, it looks like the same to me anyway. The sum of the WLs is 1, so that's what goes in front. So it'll be WL, some WL here. Okay? Anyway. This, this is a fact. Okay, how do you prove it? If you just expand the square, how you do all of these? You do summation WL sigma L squared minus 2 sigma L sigma bar plus sigma bar squared. Okay. Now the sum of the WLs is 1 here. Okay? So this this term is just sigma bar squared. Okay? For the plus sign. So how am I going to get a minus sign? Because the middle. Yeah, because of the middle. Sigma bar is a constant. Summation WL sigma L is another sigma bar. You get 2, so you get summation WL sigma L squared minus 2 sigma bar squared plus sigma bar squared, and I get that then. So it's the same thing as the proof of that. Exactly. Except it's weighted. I'm using the sum of the, sum of the WLs as 1, since the sum of the WLs is assumed to be equal to 1. Okay? You really are doing a weighted average of the sigma L's. Okay? If it's not an average, then this doesn't work out. Okay? So nicely. So now, so now what am I saying? Since I have an identity for that, which is equal to this, all I'm saying is that the variance of stratified proportional is summation WL sigma L squared, which I think we did last time. Okay? Which is equivalent to. Variance stratified proportional is equal to summation WL sigma L squared. Okay? That's the same statement. So, and I do believe we did this last time. If I did proportional sampling, I got that. Indeed. What is the proportional sampling method? Proportional sampling method is you don't know sigma H, sigma L, so you don't have to do any of this throwing money way to figure it out. You just use the capital N's. For stratified propor for proportional sampling, what happened to your 1 over n? 
forgot, yeah, I forgot my one over in here. Okay. <coughs> Proportional sampling is N sub H or N sub L is equal to N times W L. That's all. Okay. So then the variance of x bar stratified by proportional would be summation w l squared sigma l squared over n sub l. But n sub l is that. So that kills one of the w l's and puts my one over n in. So summation w l sigma l squared uh, one power sigma l squared. Okay? Exactly what I wanted. Right, so that was, okay. that's trivial to calculate the variance of x bar stratified by proportional is this. And all this theorem is stating, in essence, is that I have this identity, okay, and the result we already got for the strata right out. So what you have is that, indeed, this difference is positive. It's the variability among the sigma L's, okay, according to this weighted sigma bar, uh, uh, about the sigma bar, the, the weighted average, okay, of the standard deviations. So if there's a lot of variability in the sigmas, then the, then the optimal sampling method is, is better. Okay. If there's a lot of variability in the mu's, stratified proportional is way better than stratified random sampling. I mean, then, then no stratification at all. Okay, because we said that the x bar, that we said that sigma squared is summation W L uh, sigma L squared plus, um, which I now have an identity for, okay, plus summation W L mu L minus mu squared. This mu is already the weighted sum of the mu sub Ls, okay, so I don't have to put a mu bar on it, okay? This, and then this is summation W L, now you can put sigma L minus sigma bar squared plus sigma bar squared plus summation W L mu sub L minus mu squared. So what I can see is three different levels. Simple random sampling, the variance is this divided by N, okay? Stratified proportional, it has this divided by N. Stratified optimal, it has this divided by N, okay? So they keep getting smaller and smaller, okay? So if I call this one, two, and three, uh, I'll call this one, two, no, I'll call this one. No, I'll call this two. One and three. <laughs> if I call this one, two, and three, then I have the variance of X bar, simple random sample. It uses this notation once in the book. Most of the time in this section, he calls just simple random sample x bar. He just calls it x bar. And then at the very end, he calls it this, which I think is nicer because it's easier to read. He's talking about, but anyway, this comes out to be one plus two plus three divided by n. Okay, the variance of x bar stratified proportional comes out to be uh, two plus three divided by n, and variance x bar stratified optimal comes out to be 3 over n. Okay, that's all. So SRS is just... Simple random sample. Doesn't matter. There's no order. Simple random sample is no strata at all. I just picked n objects at random from the total population. I just mixed the two urns together. Okay. Or three urns together. Just throw everybody together and take a sample size in. Okay? So no no strata. No strata? No strata. Forget about strata. Strata is your auxiliary variable in essence. Okay? So you don't separate the like group one or two? No, there is not. I just put all the urns together. If there were urns, I'd throw them all together. So there's the optimal case. Now, how do you do the case with more than two strata? Then you have constrained optimization, right? To what? You have constrained optimization. The way that everybody does that is by Lagrange multipliers. It's a cookbook method.
Yeah, I suppose I have more strata now. So now let's go back to the optimal location one more time. Uh, general case of optimal allocation. So I figured out what the actual answer should be. I did, when I wrote down one, two, and three just now, I didn't assume I only had two strata. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now I want to generalize this as sigma bar squared, make sure it's true in all cases, all strata. All right? But I thought we did it for multiple strata cases. Two. We only did one kind of function one variable with differentiated. But you have to summate and all that, that means more than one, right? Or more than two. No, I only, well, yeah, I mean, I'm writing everything down now for more than two, but I didn't prove it for more than two. Oh, so you can prove. I proved everything except this one. Right here. For more than two. But I only proved this in the case of two strat. Uh -huh. Is everybody following what I did? Just what I did this morning. I just probably yeah, did the yeah. case of optimal general case of optimal So minimize. Yeah. Minimize. And then everything will fall out. A one squared over x one plus a two squared over x two plus so one plus a. Uh, I guess it's using capital L squared. Over x L, where x1 plus x, now L doesn't mean the high and low anymore, it means the number of strata, plus x of L equals n. And the AI, or the AL, is equal to W L sigma L, okay, is what it's going to come down to, okay? What's L? L is the stratum index, little L, capital L is the number of strata. Second stratum, third stratum. Okay. <laughs> okay. So how do I do that? Okay. Su subject to this. Subject to this. It is a standard way of doing this. Who can remember Lagrange multipliers? You first you call this f your objective function as a function of. Uh, L variables, but there is one constraint, so actually there are only L minus one free variables, but it's better to work with, to let them be free, all of them be free, and then somehow bring this in. What do you mean? So what I'm going to call this, G equals this, okay? What do you mean free? Independent variables. Independent variables? Uh -huh. You've heard that. So you're just saying <laughs> all of them are independent? Yeah, make them, treat them as if they were independent. Okay? That's yeah. the method of Lagrange multipliers. Uh -huh. They're not really independent because they have this condition. Yeah. Right? So I'm at a lower. Uh, okay, look, if I had just two variables, x1 and x2, right, I'd be looking at the whole plane, or at least the first quadrant, right? But then I have the condition x1 plus x2 is equal to n, then I'm down one dimension. I'm going to get, I'm going to get up to a line, yeah. right? X1 plus X2 is equal to N, yeah. all right? So, that's, there's the problem, okay? They're not independent. So, you know, this differentiating with respect to each one to any zero won't make any sense. Yeah. Okay. But what does happen is you can look at level curves of, of F. Okay, this is a level curve of F, okay? And here's a level curve of G, okay? I keep you take these level curves of f and tell they have these level the level curve of f has to touch the level curve of g otherwise the constraint isn't isn't established. Okay. Okay. But I want to get the one that just does touch. Okay. So this tangency condition. This is the level curve of g. G equals n. Okay. okay. This is the level curve of f. Okay. Okay. So I want to find the point x1, x2, exactly where the level curve of f just touches the level curve of g, exactly. So you have the gradient of f points in this direction, the gradient of g points in this direction, 
or actually it goes the other direction. It goes toward increasing. Okay, maybe this one goes the other way. Okay. okay? So these are the higher levels of you know, whatever. These are the, me, this is the higher levels of that here, and these are the lower levels of that. Okay. Okay. And I want to just find the minimum. Okay. So this is the gradient of f. This is the gradient of g. And the method in, in higher dimensions as well, the picture isn't so pretty. You know, it's not so obvious. You've got to think in higher dimensions, three dimensions soon. You've got SMS. You've got surfaces and stuff. Okay? But a uh, plane and, and another thing. So that's, that was not actually so bad, because this is just a plane in case of free strap. Okay? The level of surface of G. So that's really not difficult to uh, visualize in this case either. Okay, so the gradients. Uh, should be parallel. So that means the gradient of f should be parallel to the gradient of g. So you're introducing another parameter. Because since you freed up and said, oh, I'm going to really have L3 variables, now I have to put another parameter in, basically, what's the cost. So you want to solve this, you're actually adding an equation. Because what, there, are, there would be L equations here, then you have that condition subject to G is equal to N, okay? Subject to the condition that G is equal to L. So what do you have? You have uh, L plus one equations in L plus one parameters, like L X's, N is fixed, so that's not a parameter uh, variable, and then lambda. Okay, so there's L plus one equations in L plus one variables. This Lagrange multiplier method. Okay, so you have to figure out what the lambda is somehow okay, in order to solve these equations. So let's see. The gradient of f is really easy. The gradient of f, the a's and the n are all constants. Okay, so we get minus a one squared over x one squared down to minus a l squared over x l squared. Okay, that's the gradient of f. The gradient of g is trivial. It's just ones. Okay. What? Oh. G, G is this function. Okay. G is equal to this. G of x1 through xl. They're all, all functions of L variables. Okay? And then here's the constraint is equal to L. This is the uh, G equals N is the constraint. Okay? So G is a function of L variables. G. See here I had g of x is x1 plus x2, right? And I graph the constraint only, the straight line. Right? x1 plus x2 is equal to n. g of x1 from xl is equal to this. Okay, here's my definition of g. And then g equals n is the constraint. So those are the two gradients. They're easy to calculate. Now I say one should be uh, a constant multiple of the other. So gradient of f equals lambda times the gradient of g. That's pretty easy to solve because that just means, which is just lambda, lambda, lambda. You know, that means all of these, the x's should be such that they're all equal to the same number. Okay, this is equal to that. So therefore, the solution is I don't know if I'm going to have to solve for lambda in this case, it's so easy. Mm -hmm. Let's see. <laughs> okay. Therefore, minus AL squared over XL squared, oh yeah, it is, is equal to lambda for all L. Now I put in the constraint. What you always do is you solve for lambda, somehow put in the lambda equation, then you plug in the constraint. Okay, and the constraint is that the, uh, oh, first you solve for X. Okay, X of L, therefore, is equal to minus lambda over al squared square root, okay, which is equal to minus, square root of minus lambda over a sub l, so a sub positive, okay. What did we get here? I just solved this equation. This is for every l. This must be true. All right. I got a gram. I got this is equal to that. Uh -huh. This is equal to that. How so all the it? alphas are... Those are n equations. I thought it's del of g times lambda equals del x. 
lambda times the gradient of g. Yeah. Is equal to the gradient of f. Yeah. Gradient of g was one 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 one. Lambda times the gradient oh, of g okay. is lambda one 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 one. Yeah. So therefore, just now, so I'm taking care of n of the equations here. N of, excuse me, yeah, L of the equations. Because two vectors are equal if and only if they're a bunch of equal signs, right? This is equal to this means I get one equals down to this L equal signs. Okay? Mm -hmm. So here they are. Here's the L equal signs. I now solve for XL in each of those. That's pretty easy to do. And so it's a constant over a sub l. That's what it comes down to be. And now you plug that in. What's the constant? What's lambda? The it doesn't matter yeah. so much. <laughs> OK? I'm just going to call this a constant over a sub l. OK? It makes it easier because I don't want to play with the square root of since lambda so forever. The actual value of lambda is not so important. So then I get the summation xl is equal to n. This implies that that c over al, summation c over al is equal to n. Uh, did I get this right? Oh, I'm sorry. I got this wrong. This should have been this right? I got this wrong. I can't solve for xl. No words. It should be proportional to al. Let's get this right. Erase time. OK, go backwards. <laughs> Put this to the other side. Minus al squared over lambda. OK, uh -huh. with the square sign. So that means xl, gosh, you can't do my algebra. xl is equal to a constant times al. OK? They're not over al, times al. What? So I'm getting exactly the same thing as I had before. I said xl was proportional to al. Now you have to deal with the imaginary numbers? No. Forget it. Lambda's negative. Okay? As it had to be, because actually the arrow is showing that the opposite direction to make sense here. Okay? All right? Now, so I have that uh, summation XL is equal to N, and if and only if C times summation AL is equal to N, so that means C is equal to N over the sum of ALs. Okay? And so therefore XL is equal to n over the sum of the ALs times AL. Some of the ALs is just some constant. That was the sigma bar before. In fact, that's what it is here. So this is n over the sigma bar times AL was WL sigma L. Okay? Because the AL was WL sigma L, that's what AL was. So it made a substitute. I wouldn't have to carry that all the way. Some of the ALs is what we call sigma bar. So now I put it back in the sigmas. I'm done. There's only one place that's even worked out because the natural minimum, obviously. Okay. So, so then you have it. That's the answer. And so now we have it. That's exactly where we had it. Formula for x the sample size n sub l is proportional to w l sigma l. So that means that n sub l is equal to n w l sigma l over sigma bar. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have to have the sigma bar because that's what um, these w l sigma l's add up to. But that's what the equation was when you got the second order, right? Yeah, this is exactly what we had before. So we proved it. Why do you prove it again? I only proved it for case of capital O equals 2. Oh, so you just can't say everything falls out because of case Generally, two. you know, I mean, somebody had to go with nothing with Ron Goldfarb. Do you think you'd get a paper if you were 200 years ago? Ugh. I think you would. <laughs> what? <laughs> OK. In other words, generalized from the case of two, which you know now is going to work, right? All right, how would you, you know, generalize this method and then apply it to a million other problems too? Okay, I'll just do this. So, so there's the method of Rockwell parts. Now, as a graduate student, 
you're going to be required to take this and do it again. Because now what you're going to pretend is that the cost of sampling depends on the stratum. So you're going to try to minimize, the, you're going to fix the cost, you're going to fix how much money you're willing to spend total. And then you have to allocate it again. All right? Yeah, so what you're going to do is you're going to take a G difference. What okay. problem is that? So minimize. Oh, cool. So generalization. What problem was that? 54. Minimize S of X, 1 through XL. F is the same. Okay. Subject to um, the cost, G of X1 through XL equals the cost equals C0, a uh, an overhead cost, plus now a certain cost per sample, summation CL and L, uh, XL. is equal to, this is a constraint, a fixed cost, C, okay? Capital C, we'll use that capital C dollars, all right? This is the definition of G, okay? So, is it cost, XL is just corresponds to the number of samples in the L stratum. So this is capital CL dollars per sample. Pretend it just costs a different amount, you know, to audit an expensive, to audit a Ferrari versus a Volkswagen, okay? You know, it just costs different, okay? <laughs> I don't know why. Okay, but let's say it did, okay? Then you have another minimization problem. The different constraints, slightly different constraints. Now, the uh, gradient of G is not, it's still constant, but it's, it's a series of constants. C1, C2, C3, up to CL, capital L. Well, then you just, you just end up in the lambdas. Yeah, you can end up in the lambdas, and then, you know, you got to carry this whole thing through, and, you know, you have to do some algebra. Okay, and you'll get the whoa, whoa, whoa. And then you get a formula then. So you have F of X, For the Ls, ends. And then you have G of X, Ls. Yeah, this is your objective function. So you still this is your constraint. Uh -huh. So, Oh, okay. So you're still going to use this cookbook and multiply by the gradient equals yeah. some sort of way. You're going to do the gradient of F equals lambda on the gradient of G. It's just going to redo the thing. The only thing that's going to difference is the gradient of G is not going to be C1 through C sub capital L. Uh -huh. It only gets interesting when you start solving for the X in terms of the C's and you start plugging those back in and you have these summation signs. Okay? You have to write it all down. You have to make the things go to work. Okay? This is not doable. Yes, it is. It's very easy. Compared to a lot of other things that might have to be good. Okay? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, now you turn it around also. So lambda is still one constant? Right. Okay. Yeah. Still a constant. A parameter. Or a scaling parameter that just goes out of, in and out of the problem. Okay. And then you still solve it. Like, you know, I get. I just, I just renamed it minus 1 over the square root of lambda, you know, the square root of minus 1 over lambda, I, I renamed it C just to, just to make it easier, all right? So just I can it. So you, in, you solve for lambda essentially here, okay? Uh -huh. Solve for the C. Uh -huh. You do have to solve for it, okay. okay, to get the answer, okay? Oh, should give out the answer. Okay. Um, now, they also have you turn it around. Suppose I want to fix the variance. How do I minimize the cost? Then you turn it around. So then you, you make this the objective function. Okay, so the number of samples is not now fixed. So we the variance is going to be fixed. This number is going to be fixed. So I, there's a certain quality as to how close I want my estimator to be, and I want to minimize the cost. Yeah, you really. So I figure I fix the variance and then I can minimize the cost in this different allocation. Okay, so now the total sample size is not clear. All right. So then you actually find the total sample size at the end as the, as the end result. Okay. Oh my God. 
All right. So then that's just to put these two bits. Then you'll really have, then you'll know what branch multiple is. Okay? Oh. Right. For the day. My okay. grad probably sucks. Uh, you should make an extra credit. You can make it the last part extra credit, you know, part C. You know, you got to do part C. Okay. Wow. First you do it without, without uh, first you just redo the problem as we already did it. Part A is just a rehash, so there's a constant in there because the gradient of G is still constant. Alright? Excuse me, it's still a uh, trivial constant. <laughs> C1, 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 C1. Right, so then it's exactly this problem again. C1, C1, C1. Oh, yeah, so first you do it with just okay. where all the CLs are the same. same. And then you do where all the CLs are going to be different. Okay, and then part C is reverse the objective function and the constraint function. Okay. All right. Well, that's it for that part. Um, that's uh, stratified sampling. Uh, we're done except for going to the exercises. So maybe we should start talking a little bit about this review exam and so that you can have a look at it before Tuesday. Again, uh, I think you announced right at the beginning of the class we'll do the, uh, student evaluations on Tuesday. Okay. What about Thursday? Do so we have a class Thursday? Yes, you do. Usually I don't do it on Thursday because uh, it's the last day of class. You don't do your reviews? Yeah, we'll still do a review, of course. Okay. Do you want, it, do you want to vote? When do you want to take a student evaluation? Would you rather do it on Thursday next week or Tuesday? Doesn't matter. I usually do it on Tuesday because it's just not the last, I don't want to save it for the very last thing that's kind of silly. Can you talk about this Thursday instead of Tuesday because we have homework due Tuesday? Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, if you don't want to do it now, that's fine. I just thought I'd go through it a little bit and just tell you the flavor of it. Um, I think the first four problems are pretty self explanatory. I did. On the first problem, I, I'm making you know what uh, standard normal density is, and I'm making you know uh, what the definition of a chi-square rent variable is. Do you know the standard normal density formula for it? No. I'm not even asking for the general normal density, but just the standard normal density. You the minus x squared over 2. There'll probably be this table in the back anyway. There's probably a formula for it. When I give you that table on page A7, I think there's a formula for it on that page. You know? Okay. That's the standard normal density. <laughs> I'm going to give you some tables. So I didn't sh I'll didn't. i bring the tables, the addenda, the addenda that I would have next time. Not quite. Okay. It's not on there? No. Oh, darn. But I can always do it. Yeah. Use a, use a practice test. Sorry about that. I didn't give that to you. Uh, yeah, they didn't give you the formula. Huh. Interesting. Oh, well. It's simple enough You don't even need to know the constant for this problem. You just need to know it's this. Okay? And that the integral of that is equal to 1. Okay? So you don't actually have need to know the correct constant. So, for problem 1, I'm asking you to find a moment generating function. Because I'm going to run out of problems. If I only focus on chapter 7, then it could be harder, actually. No, don't focus on chapter 7. Okay. So the first two problems are a little central limit problem. Uh, see if you can find the moment generating function of a chi-square random variable with one degree of freedom. Um, because that's come, actually, we did that in class a little bit. We had some discussions around this when we talked about getting the fourth moment on um, standard normal. So. Okay, so I summarized that problem again. And then I just started asking you to do the first problem in the um, homework set on chapter 7 again. I just line it up and have you do that problem again. And then I actually have it do you do that again in problem 5, where I ask you to do it with sample of pairs. The only problem, what I really want you to do is this one thing you hadn't done yet, is that actually calculate the actual bias and actual variance of a ratio estimator in a small sample case. The only problem is you're going to have there, you know, you have to list all the samples. And then they don't actually, um, what was interesting when I actually did this problem number five, 
I'll tell you what happened. When I had capital N is equal to 5, and then I took little n is equal to 2, I would get 10 samples. 5 choose 2, because all possible samples would be 10. And then the, bi form the actual bias and the actual variance didn't relate at all to the formulas. Okay, in the, for the approximate bias and approximate variance, because those were a little bit large. So then I said, okay, I can still only get 10 samples if I take little n equals 3. Now let me calculate the, the exact bias and the exact variance of the ratio estimator. Okay? You can still do it. The exact variance comes out a lot closer to the approximate variance. Okay? And the exact bias is pretty small. It doesn't correlate to the actual answer in the book, but it's small enough that it doesn't really matter anyway. Okay? And, um, so that's what I had to do. So I didn't actually have you compare the, the exact bias to the approximate bias to the exact variance to the approximate variance. What I did have you do was, uh, at the end there, I asked you about MSEs. So I did ask about mean square error, even though that was never discussed much in the book. This these problems, I did ask you to discuss MSE. So you might want to study that just a little bit. Okay. And probably, you know, and we'll go through them and we'll revise them and just see if it's way too long. But you'll probably want a calculator. You want a scientific calculator. Oh. Because when I actually take, for example, if I want the, if I have 10 numbers and I want the population variance, you want to do that by hand? No. Okay. So you're going to want to do your calculator. Okay. Some of them are easy by hand, but if they're actual odd numbers like 8 thirds and 16 thirds and weird things like that, you're going to want your calculator. So how much would do this? Well, you'll have too many hours if you don't have your calculator. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Oh. <laughs> A lot of arithmetic, right? <laughs> so I might put an extra credit problem on here probably, you know, just to make it. Since you do that two and a half hours, I'll probably throw okay. no problem. Nice. But I'm not telling you what it is right now. So I'll figure out what all the tables are and stuff like that, and I'll bring those on Tuesday. Cheat sheets? The cheat sheets. I'll bring you cheat sheets on Tuesday okay. so you'll know what they look like. All right. Okay? All right. All right, that's it for today.